And, and he, he spends two hundred million, sorry, two hundred to two million dollars a year <coughs> on this this youth program. So he has um, uh, processes that he goes through. He has uh, supplements to his diet. He has a special diet, and, and he just spends hours and hours every <coughs> day trying to reverse the aging process. And the thing that stood out uh, to me was all of this energy and, and all of these aspirations are very self-focused. It's, it's about him. And, and sadly, as this story unfolded on the TV, uh, he had a relationship with his two children, but it didn't seem that he had a wife or a partner or anybody else to share his life with. He was sharing his life with himself. He, uh, Brian Johnson is 45 years old, and the research has shown that he's got the heart of a 37-year-old. I would have thought after uh, spending that many million dollars that you might hope for a bit less than a heart of a 37-year-old. I mean, John's probably got the heart of a 37-year-old as it is. And uh, my response in the end was, well, get back to me in 40, 50 years, and uh, maybe then I'll be impressed, but not quite so much at the moment. And, and I thought, by way of contrast, of uh, someone who did live to be 87, and that is Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa, of course, started the Catholic Missionary uh, Organisation. Uh, she helped people in need. She looked after poor people, sick people, unwanted people, dying people. Uh, she was uh, the first person to start uh, a home for people who were dying of AIDS. She lived her 87 years in the service of other people. And I find that is just an incredible contrast to, to Brian Johnson, <laughs> living his life in pursuit of his own personal interests, as opposed to Mother Teresa living for everybody else. Well, we're focusing on the five purposes of the church, and uh, because uh, I'm running out of time, we're going to think about two purposes today. Uh, the first one is that God created us to be servants, to be ministers. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, oh, sorry, um, Henry, did, did you pop up the picture of, yeah, did you, did you see that? That was uh, Ron Johnson in 2017 and 2023. I don't know what you think, I reckon it's a bit weird in 2023. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that what you inspired to the more youthful version of Anyway, let's get back to uh, Ephesians 2 at this point. Where it says that uh, we are God's work which created in Christ Jesus to do good work. Uh, which God has prepared us to do. God, God has created us, and, and he has in mind good works, good <coughs> service for us to do for other people. You see, uh, to, to quote Rick Warren, you were made to make a contribution, not just to consume. That's why God has put us here. He, this is why people become member, members of a church, so that they can make that contribution to the church family and more broadly to the kingdom of God. Uh, in Ephesians 4 and verse 11 and 12, it says, uh, It was he, uh, God, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for the works of service. This is uh, our fourth purpose that we would serve. And I want to put before you, before you four things that are, I believe the Bible teaches about us being servants or ministers. Firstly, that we were created in the first place for ministry. Ephesians 2 and verse 10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he's prepared us in advance to do. This is what we were created for, for ministry. The second thing is that we were actually called to ministry. And in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you would not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is, this is our calling, all of us. Thirdly, you are gifted for ministry. Uh, 1 Peter 4 says, Each one should use whatever gift he has been given to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in all its various forms. And fourthly, we are commanded to minister. Um, um, Matthew records in chapter 20 that <coughs> Jesus uh, was talking about his ministry and uh, talking about our ministry. And he says, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to become first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, um, Henry, if you could just go to that next slide. These four ideas, we were created for ministry, we were called for ministry, we were gifted for ministry, and we were commanded for, for ministry. And I want to ask you at this point, uh, do you agree with that? Are you convinced that this is what the Bible actually says? If you don't, um, I will give you a pass for the rest of the sermon because I don't think you really understand anything that I have to say. <coughs> and if you do believe that this is actually the, the Bible teaching, then the question becomes, what do you do about it? What, what do you... Uh, how are you shaping your life to fulfil this purpose of being involved in ministry? Well, from reading that Joel read to us earlier about the sheep and the goats, it, it, it talks about, which is a, a, a biblical idea, that uh, God will reward us. Not, um, you know, it's not our, on what our salvation is based on. But God will reward us for the things that, that we've done. In fact, in Matthew 16 and verse 27 it says, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with all his angels, and he will reward each person according to what he's done. And this uh, picture in Matthew 25 that you read, it, it's a, a, a poetic picture. It teaches us very clearly that Jesus thinks it's important for us to, to meet the physical needs of people around us. Uh, what is amazing is that it's, it's not faith that's mentioned in this poetic picture, but it's simple acts of kindness. And I think Jesus is saying uh, much the same as James says in his letter, that when we have faith, and that faith saves, saves us, it should have an impact in the way that we live out our life. Faith is a motivation. Faith is a reason to act. This is what James says. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, James says, faith by itself is not accompanied. That is not, a, not accompanied by action. Is dead. Well, Jesus in this poetic picture divided people into two groups, and uh, one uh, were sheep, and, and one were goats. And, and it's the sheep, it's those on the right that receive the rewards. He says. Uh, for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. We're not talking about great deeds, but simple acts of kindness to people who are in need. Some food drink, a visit, something that takes the focus off ourselves and meets the needs of other people. 
One commentator uh, writes, and I, I, I thought this was worthy to quote him for. He says, we cannot love God and hate those who are made in his image, even if they're people who are very different from us and who do not, we do not particularly like. Nowhere does Jesus tell us to like everybody, but he does command us to love everybody, even our enemies. When he talks about love, He's talking about something that goes far beyond feelings. Simply expressed, to love as Jesus loved is to meet whatever human needs we have, the opportunity and the means for them. So according to this poetic picture that Jesus shares, God judges our reaction to human need and, and shares his kingdom with those who provide kindness. But if God uh, uh, judges our action, um, it, it's important <coughs> that we meet the needs of others, not ignore them. Uh, Matthew 25 and four, verse 41 says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared, prepared by the devil. The, the wicked uh, here are sent away, uh, be, not because they committed any crime, they didn't murder anybody, they didn't commit adultery, they didn't steal. It's for what they failed to do in response to human need. Again, Matthew 25 and verse 42. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison. You did not look up. You see, these people find themselves condemned because they accepted the devil's suggestion of self-interest, of looking after their own needs, but not looking after the needs of other people. And as a consequence of focusing on themselves, they find themselves separated from God's reward. And their, their flimsy ex excuses that, well, if I knew it was you, I, I would have done it. But it, it doesn't wash up. And, and those who, who did uh, offer the acts of kindness, uh, they did it, not expecting that it, they were doing it for God. But uh, the king will reply in verse 40, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. See, we are called to minister and minister to the needs of others. This is the fourth purpose of our life. The fifth purpose is that we were actually made for a mission, and that mission is to share the good news with unbelievers. In John chapter 17, where Jesus is praying for his disciples, uh, he, says, he says this, in the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. Jesus very clearly had this idea that his disciples were to continue the work that he started. And in John 20, 20, uh, verse 21, Jesus said, As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And he goes on to, to repeat uh, that idea in, in the book of Acts as well, that they should be his witnesses. This is an idea that uh, Paul took up. Paul had this sense of, of God had given him a mission to take the gospel to the world. And in Acts 20, uh, Paul says this, the most important thing is that I complete my mission, the work the Lord Jesus gave me to tell people the good news of God's grace. And, and so this mission has been passed down from generation and to generation, from century to century, that we too have a mission in the world to shine God's light, to share the good news of the gospel with people. And Jesus said in, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he said to uh, people there before, before he ascended, he said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the and Jesus was saying, I want you to be my witnesses 
to people who are close by, who are near. There's an opportunity to speak to them. I want you to, to be my witness to people who are in, in Samaria. These are people who are different, but they're nearby. And you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. That he's saying it's God's plan that everybody, every human being who's been humanity, should hear the gospel and should accept eternal life through Jesus and, and enter the kingdom of God. You see, God wants us to be his witnesses in this way. It's interesting that he, he simply says where to be his witnesses. He doesn't say that we'd be salesmen or where to be his defence lawyer or anything else. He says where to be his witnesses, where to tell people what God has done for us, how it's changed our lives and potentially how it can change their lives as well. So let's think about these, these three areas that Jesus said. Firstly, he says you are to be my witnesses, he says, in, in Jerusalem, to those people who are close by. And we need to share the gospel with people in our world, in our neighbourhood, in our workplace, in our family. Uh, in Luke 8, he says to a man, this man who's, who's had demons cast out of him, and uh, you know, he was a disheveled uh, man, his life was a mess, and Jesus saves him. Pass out the, de the, the demons, and this guy wants to follow Jesus and go with him. And Jesus says this, uh, he says, go back home and tell people how much God has done for you. So that, that man went all over town telling how much God had done for him. See, our mission, like the mission of this guy, is to start at home, to start in our neighborhood, to start in our community. And God wants us to tell our friends and family, our colleagues. These are people who know us. These are people who understand us, who may have a sense of respect and admiration, people who are prepared to listen to us. And God says, I want you to share the gospel with these people. And there's a, um, I, I forget his name, but uh, there's a book called um, Concentric Circles of Concern. And this guy um, maps out in great detail the circles of influence in his life from uh, people he, who he's known for a long time, he's very close to, uh, to people he has a casual relationship with, um, you know, maybe at the shop or the restaurant they go to meet with. And, and the idea is these are people who might trust us, these are people who might listen to what we have to say. And we and share our gospel, our faith, our joy with those people. Sometimes we're reluctant to do that because we think that people aren't interested. And I want to suggest to you that that is not necessarily true. Um, the Crinkle research, uh, so um, McCrinkle uh, is, uh, is a Christian and an Australian, and after the, the 2021 census, uh, he did some research, particularly around religious questions, asking uh, more detailed questions than were actually asked in the census. And under a heading in, uh, in his book, um, Religion in Australia is Not Dead, he writes this. He says, two-thirds of Australians, 68%, currently follow a religion or have spiritual that's a pretty significant figure. It means, like we would, I think, assume from what we hear in the media, that everybody out there is an atheist. They're all hostile and they're not prepared to listen to a word that we have to say. I think that's the picture that's painted sometimes. But according to this research, that is not true. 68% of people either have a religious belief or are, are some sort of um, spiritual belief. Now, 68% are not Christian, and some of those spiritual beliefs are nothing like Christian. But at least they're open to having a conversation. I want to show you two slides from the clinical research. Um, this is people's attitude um, to, towards Christianity. And you'll notice the blue section down the bottom um, 
it is, I uh, hope you can read it, um, the blue section, I have some issues with Christianity. This is number five, number six, uh, I have uh, strong reservations. And number seven, I am passionately opposed. The passionately opposed group is actually a very small group. The others represent people who may be open for conversation. And head with the next slide, please. And, and these are our people, again, that's difficult to read, let me read it for you. The question was, do you ever talk about spirituality or religion when you gather with your friends? Could the answer is that? 46% occasionally, 9% often, only 45% never. These are people who are not Christian, but they will spontaneously enter into a conversation about spiritual things. I don't think people are as closed as we think, and I think we're led to that conclusion by a biased media. Remember uh, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. It says, God doesn't want anyone to be lost, but he wants people to change their hearts. Secondly, we need to reach people who are beyond our world. Love demands that we step out of our comfort zone. These are the people who Jesus described as being in Samaria. Uh, people with a different background, a different education, different language perhaps, different economics. And you see our, our mission uh, has eternal consequences, so we need to be a little uncomfortable and be prepared to speak to these people. Paul did it. Paul says in Romans uh, 1, sorry, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 22, that he says to the, to, the, uh, to the weak, I became weak, to a bit of weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. So Christians, we're called to build bridges and not walls. And I think too often we are guilty of building walls. We, we want to be right. And, and I think... I don't know that God ever calls us to be right. He calls us to connect with other people. And you can be right, but if you're right, and right, being right is a priority in your life, I would suggest to you that you are right and one you at the same time. We are the world bridges, not walls. Repeatedly in the Bible, we're told to reach out and we're told to Jaguars. Jesus always supported the underdog, the people in that society wanted to ignore or to push to the sides, the people who were powerless, the people who were poor, the people who were left behind, the people who were imprisoned or orphaned or widowed. All those marginalised people are the people that Jesus reached out to and had concern for. And it's reaching beyond ourselves. And, and it, it takes me back to uh, Brian Johnson. I focused on himself as opposed to Mother Teresa reaching out uh, to a needy world. And those words, I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me something to eat. This is the, the attitude, the posture that we are, to, we are to, to live in. The third thing is that we need to care about the whole world. Uh, look, the Bible seeks the gospel to go everywhere. Uh, Mark 16 and verse 15, uh, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the good news. Jesus told his disciples to go into all the world and to tell everybody that he paid the penalty for sin, that they are forgiven and they live eternally. You know, we're, we're not selling a scam. We are actually bringing good news. And good news presented within that context is always good news to be well received. Rick Warren says uh, that, he points out that uh, in Jesus' day, taking the gospel to the whole world basically meant, uh, by way of transportation, walking or riding a donkey. But of course today is very different. We have ships and planes and trains and cars, and of course we have the internet. Uh, we can use 
the internet uh, to share the gospel with other people. We could sit at home on the lounge in our pajamas and share the gospel around the world. Uh, I've been listening uh, in the last few weeks to a podcast from, uh, 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 it's produced from a lady in Canada. Uh, she talks about history and she draws in Christian truth. And she said recently, uh, she's, she's not an academic, she's actually nobody particularly famous or well known. She does a bit of research and uh, she talks about it. And she said recently that she has 3,000 uh, followers of her podcast. Well, what an amazing thing that is, that you could take, potentially, a topic that you have an interest in, know something about, uh, kind of weave in a gospel message to that and get 3,000 listeners, uh, all from the uh, comfort of, of your own lounge. But that's an amazing thing, but that's the opportunity that is open to us in the world today. And uh, I've heard uh, that there are many remote villages in the world today. They don't have uh, running water, they don't have sewerage, but they do have email. And they go on their, their phones and their computers. <coughs> but let me conclude by asking you a question. The question is, is anybody going to be in heaven because of you? It kind of sounds a scary question. It sounds a big question. But uh, as I, I um, thought about that question, uh, a song came to mind by Ray, Ray Bowles. Um, it was popular uh, four or five years ago, and it's called Thank You. The premise of this song uh, begins, uh, he dreamt he went to heaven. And the second verse goes like this. And he, uh, so he's walking in heaven, and uh, a man comes to him and says, Friend, you may not know me now, but then he said, But wait, you used to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight. And every week you would say a prayer before the class would start. And one day when you said that prayer, I asked Jesus in my life. What an amazing, the simple thing to commit to teach Sunday school to commit to uh, teach scripture, to commit to do anything, but to faithfully bring that message of, of Jesus, the good news of salvation to people, and one day find in eternity that your efforts actually led someone to <coughs> How even more amazing would that be if uh, your podcast, something you did on the internet, actually led someone to Christ and you never knew about it? On average, 128,000 Australians die every year. And on average, 54 million people in the world die every year. Most of them go to a Christless eternity. And that is a tragedy. If we care, we must share. And there are four possible responses that we can have. We could respond like Moses and say, who, me? We could respond like Jonah and say, not me. We could respond like Habakkuk and say, why me? Or we could respond like Isaiah and say, sin. Our Father, we see uh, a need for people with a uh, need for, for food, clothing, and clean water, and free food. We see uh, a, a needy world that needs to know Jesus and the salvation of the universe. And I pray, Father, that you would meet both those needs. And I pray that you would use all of us to do that. That you would mould our hearts and shape our thinking so that we might be prepared to be part of your